Hi, everyone. This is Surabi Beach, and I'm so excited to bring you back another episode of Mom Strength with my special guest here today, Annika Dalla. Uh, I, I won't tell you how to let me know how to pronounce her last name. I'll let her say it. But Annika and I met online through Maya, one of her colleagues, who's also a dietitian. Maya and Annika are dietitians. And we did a fantastic Instagram live together a few months ago. And I was, I need to talk to her more. She is <laughs> full of wisdom, experience, and I love the way she presents her information. I'm going to introduce her. So she's a registered dietitian out of Hamilton, Ontario, and she works virtually all across Ontario. And she can sometimes see clients across Canada as well. Her practice focuses around chronic illnesses like diabetes to Crohn's disease, she works with a lot of individuals who have IBS and perceived food fears. Her ultimate goal for her clients, regardless of their condition, is to heal their relationship with food and find food freedom. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about diet culture, decolonizing food, and food freedom. Welcome, Annika. I'm Yay. so excited you're here. I'm so excited too. It's awesome to finally get to chat one-on-one. -on -one. I think our Instagram live was a huge success um, maybe for our followers, but also just for us too. I think it was such a great way to connect and meet people, um, that are like-minded as well as, you know, in the field, because we're in it in, in the physio, not as much in the physio, but in the fitness field and the diet, mm -hmm. the diet nutrition field, there was a lot of diet culture that's, you know, sugar coated as non diet culture. And when you have the same values, you immediately connect over that. So yeah. I want to hear from you. What is tell me a little bit about yourself, your own experience with diet culture. Um, tell me everything. Yeah, I love that pun, by the way, just a side note. Uh, so obviously, you already introduced me. My name is Annika Dalla, like a Dalla bill. Um, <laughs> and, uh, registered dietitian out in Hamilton, Ontario. But yes, I focus quite a bit with individuals with chronic illnesses that, you know, I feel like a lot of the time when we deal with those illnesses, or even prevention of diabetes, hypertension, there's a lot of diet culture that goes into it where people are just kind of told that, oh, you can't eat this, you can't eat that you can't have, you know, you can't have the donut at the party, you can't have carbs, you can't even have the bread, you can't have any salt, you can't do that. Like, it's just all these can't, 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 can't. And then yes. there's no food that you can eat aside from salad, <laughs> which is not really an option for a lot of my clients. Cause I want to say that most of them, maybe 80% of them are of their brown and we don't eat salad. So no. it's just, like, you're like, like I could have sog or I could have salad. You know, what am I going to eat? I'm having yeah. onion <laughs> and cucumber. And plain lettuce. And people are obsessed over their salad dressings, which I'm okay. Good dressing is great, but that's not, that's just not going to jive for us. You know, it's not the cultural staple, you know? And I think that that's a big part of it is when we're looking at this chronic illness prevention or managing chronic illness, individuals go into the space of, well, I can't have this and I can't have that. And then my doctor told me that I have to have salad all the time and I can't eat rice. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Like, I know. Just, well, like, I huge red flag. And then like big question marks start going off in my head. I'm like, who's your doctor? And why? Are that's what I want to say. Well, everything? and <laughs> like, if you speak to doctors, they're not, they're not educated on nutrition. No. You know, they might take a couple lectures, but it's the same with movement. They're not, they've mm -hmm. learned movement for one week, like physiotherapy mm -hmm. school is minimum two years. And then you're taking a ton yeah. of post-grad courses and that's after an undergraduate degree. So for anyone listening, if your doctor is giving you advice on something that is out of their scope without sending you a referral to a dietitian, to a physiotherapist, to somebody who is an expert in that, just take it with a grain of salt. Like, yeah doesn't have to be a fact. <laughs> yeah. And no pun intended there. <laughs> yeah. With a grain, with a few grains of salt. Salt's okay. Yeah. Salt's fine. Um, yeah. Like most physicians actually get about a week of nutrition training as well. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, that puts like us in that expert category because it takes four years for school. Then we have to do a comprehensive competitive internship. Um, and that too, like as a dietitian, like I don't just work in my private practice. I also work in, you know, long-term care. So I'm working in those spaces where like I'm working in an interdisciplinary team of physiotherapists, um, speech language pathologists, physicians, nursing, like I'm working with everybody to provide that care for the residents there too. So, you know, like we work in that healthcare field and it's just like, 
refer to us. We definitely know what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and like giving you the recommendation of, okay, yeah, just have a salad for every meal is not going to cut it. No, like, it's not good enough to me. Like, I'm like, that sounds like a really boring life of a lot of vinegar and dressing yeah, <laughs> that you and, just have to like live with. Yeah. And you don't get all your nutrients. You don't get your protein. Mm-hmm. You don't get your, you know, so much from there. And the interesting thing is we're, we're talking about diet culture and it's often blamed on like the individual people, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I'm, uh, I need to separate from diet culture, but ultimately it's a huge systemic issue that even yeah. <laughs> this within healthcare. So we can't blame our clients or individual people for feeling this way about their bodies and their food. Definitely not. And it's just like the system that, that we're in. Um, Definitely. And I think that like, when we look at the, the big overarching thing is like, we've lived in this society of diet culture, right? Like, so it starts like, I would even say like in the 1800s people were like oh well we have to like be healthier to live longer but like what is healthy like healthy is in quotes there um because healthy could be looking different for everybody and it depends on your lifestyle it depends on like your like genetics it depends on your like social status and like um socioeconomic status your access to food your access to clean drinking water like at least that's what it was in the 1800s but none of that has changed And I think that that's stuff that like, we don't even consider when we put that shame and blame onto people in the healthcare system of like, oh, well, you know, like it's just because of their weight. That's the reason why they look like that. Or that's the reason why that they have all these chronic conditions, but without even taking into consideration all of the other aspects of things like, you know, what, what about their family history? Like both of their parents have diabetes and as well as their grandparents and their sisters and brothers have diabetes. Why wouldn't they have diabetes or pre-diabetes? It's like saying like, oh yeah, like my hair is brown and my mom's hair is brown and my dad's hair is brown and then my grandma's hair is brown when I suddenly land up with blonde hair. <laughs> it can happen, but the it's likelihood be rare. is yeah. very low. Yeah. Right. So looking at that genetic kind of component to things is really important because then we actually see that bigger picture. Right. Then we see that like, okay, well, there's a there's something else going on here. Or hey, maybe they don't have diabetes. Maybe they have other types of insulin resistance that like is not being explored because it's just getting umbrella termed because of their weight. Right. Yeah. It's so quick to judge based on someone's weight that their health conditions are all you know, due to their weight, your pain, your yeah. knee pain, your, your back pain, your, your diabetes, it's all just weight yeah. related. Right. And that's exactly, it's just a problem to even blame the weight. Yeah. Um, what is and your, we, own, oh, sorry. like, cause I'm just thinking you grew up in Canada, but your background is, you know, Indian and I grew up in India and I'm Indian <laughs> until <laughs> I was, t- I moved here when I was 10. And so I noticed a huge difference in diet culture there versus here Yeah, in the sense that there. I was very thin. I, you know, as a child, it wasn't, it was never restrictive. Never. It was Mm -hmm. eat more, eat more, eat more, have more sweets, have everything. My grandparents used to buy me all the sweets to try to fatten me up. And then I moved here and I was still on the small side, but it was like, suddenly people were trying to lose weight all the time. And people were asking Mm -hmm. me for advice on how to get thin. And I was like, It's genetic. I I can't give you any advice. And so for me, it was a huge culture shock in that way, because it's a huge, you know, big difference in in diet culture. How did you find it in your home? I grew up here in Canada and I was, I was born and raised in the prairies. So uh, people around me were primarily white. I want to say like, I was the only colored kid growing up until I was like in grade four. So I was like, I don't even know what like you guys are doing because like my household, like we speak other languages and like we do prayers that are very different. We don't celebrate Christmas. We don't do all these things, but we have this central idea of food. And like my friends would come over to our house and my mom would always be cooking everything and just like being super mom because that's what she is um just in my eyes at least um but she would be cooking everything from scratch just because like we didn't have an Indian store and um so in our household like food was a big part of our culture because that's all we had really like to hold on to um and then you know as I grew up and you know left the house left the nest uh 
you know, in my teenage years, I was able to really see that like, oh my gosh, my mom was always watching her weight. And I never oh. knew about it because we were always just cooking at home. But like, maybe it was because like, she didn't want to eat from outside places, like from yeah. outside sources, yeah. um, which like, again, we got to learn all these Indian dishes, but it's because she was like, I'm not eating like, outside food. Cause I might gain um, too much weight or yeah, exactly. And like, even throughout, like, cause I have a few siblings and she like, I I'm the oldest. So I would always like watch her be pregnant. Um, <laughs> I would just watch her be pregnant. Um, she was always doing like her aerobics classes, like eight months into her pregnancies. Like wow. she was like, she was just like super active going on runs with her stroller and which is like also so rare for moms of that generation. So like kudos to your mom for being active, especially as a Brown mom, like that is probably a huge, you know, arm, right? Yeah. Well, she was also uh, like a professional athlete in India. So she was very much like a lot of, a lot of like athleticism that she just needed to pent up and go with it. Cause otherwise it would just be like, chaos stress, probably. <laughs> yeah so I think it was just a big stress reliever for her yeah um I can't speak on everything of her experience aside from like what I've witnessed but yes. you know I I did realize that like oh it's because she was worried about her weight when I was in my teenage years and then like as I grew older I was like oh wow like a lot of Indian moms aren't like that it's like exactly what you sort of yeah um, alluded to there it was like a lot of Indian moms aren't like that um and, you know, growing up, I didn't even realize I was different mm. in that Indian scope until like later when I moved away and I was like, oh my God, there's other Indians here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm sure that some of the culture she absorbed was from living in a place where it's so white, right? Yeah. Like you, you live, you live in a culture that's surrounded by, you know, one attitude, you start to absorb that even if you're Indian or even if you're a different background. Um, Definitely. That's so interesting. And so how did you feel about your own body? Did you feel the pressure as well once you became a teenager and you were like, okay, I also have to watch my weight or was that, was it? So I am one of those people that got like really big boobs really quickly. (laughs) So I like had these big boobs that were like, you know, huge. And I was just like tiny little lady and like, or a little girl, I guess with like boobs. Yeah. So I was always like self-conscious about that. And like, as I grew older, I was like, oh, these are great. <laughs> but I know. You know. <laughs> Meanwhile, all the, all the ones with small chests, we were like, I hate this girl. <laughs> <laughs> right. But like, it took me a while to get there. And like, you know, my mom always, cause she like would wear low tops and stuff. And she'd be like, just, just do it. Just want it because you have it. And then I like realized that like, it would get me like into trouble because like I'd obviously have these huge boobs that I was just like here I am (laughs) um but like that I think was like a big it wasn't really about my weight it was always about my boobs yeah so I'd wear like t-shirts in the pool and stuff I was nervous about like going to swimming lessons and I was a competitive swimmer and like Mm. all my friends were like little sticks and I was just like boobs (laughs) so I like couldn't really like that was my biggest concern I think growing up um, and as I got older again, I like really like just was like, this is awesome. I can do yeah, so this many is your things. body. Yeah. <laughs> like I can do so many things with my body and like still have <laughs> these boobs. Um, so I think that's like where it didn't affect me as much, but I know that it affected my siblings a lot more in terms mm-hmm. of like, okay, well, like we have to look a certain way. And like my sister, she was in like the Miss Teen Canada pageant, like she was the winner of that pageant uh back in the early two thousand whatever 2012 or 2010 I can't even remember it was a while ago um but you know she was like dealing with pageant life and like all of that so it really affected that aspect and it really actually pushed me to understand that diet culture and like pursue my education in dietetics actually was Very like cool. seeing that sort of um what like your body what your ex- expectation of a body is supposed to be and what the standard of beauty is and like of course my like old Indian grandfather would always be like Anika you're the smart one and your sister is the pretty one my sister is very smart like I'm talking like she's the sharpest knife in the drawer and um I'm smart but I, I think I'm pretty too so it was kind of just like oh okay that's fun because my sister was like 
thin and like tall. Right. And it's that combination of, of like the patriarchal view or like the, mm -hmm. you know, or not even patriarchal, like the misogynistic view, right? Yeah, like the exactly. women who are thin or tall are are the pretty ones. And you're like, I'm I'm also beautiful, but I just don't have that, you know, body. Yeah, I'm like is sorry, very... I'm five feet tall <laughs> and like big boobs. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like five feet big boobs, and I'm like here, and my sister's like super tall and gorgeous and like yeah. you know she's like not that she's like she's very 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 beautiful but like so am I come yeah. on yeah so I think that like standard of beauty was like very pronounced in our household because like I've got a very tall gorgeous sister and I'm a very small gorgeous lady <laughs> so you know we had this space of like what's tall what's small what's pretty what's not pretty yeah um and then when it came to the food aspect, I think like, as I got older, again, like we're kind of progressing through my life history right now. Um, in my mid twenties, I was able to actually like go and live in India and do my senior thesis there. That's and awesome. that's where like things really started to hit me where I was like, oh, chronic illness is a completely different ball game there. Um, and like, especially in the aspect of women. So like women in chronic illnesses in India, they hide a lot of the times if they have diabetes or hypertension. Hmm. Um, and <clears throat> if you actually look, there's a book called um, Sugar Intention uh, by Leslie Weaver. I think that's her name. Uh, you can fact check that. <laughs> but she writes this book about, she actually interviewed women in India about sugar and sugar being diabetes right because that's how mm -hmm. we refer to diabetes in India as well oh well, you, your sugar sugar's high yeah it's like that means you have diabetes they don't want to say diabetes because there's this taboo around it right but the sugar is high so women actually hide the fact that they have high sugar uh because they don't want to be seen as failures right Wow. They don't want to be seen as, you know, oh, well, we don't feed our family properly and that's why we have diabetes. So a lot of the time women end up with like um, diabetes, keto ketoacidosis uh, because they're not treating their diabetes. So that's what like Leslie Weaver found in her book. But then my research really focused around, okay, well, what about like the food? What about the processed food that's coming through? India and like do those things need to have potentially an excise tax so you know other countries have did, done this like England South Africa um, some places in South America Mexico they've done this excise tax on sugar sweetened beverages just like Canada was considering it earlier this year as well um, so that was why I kind of was branching off and being like okay well we'll talk to another quote-unquote commonwealth country we're not talking about that but <laughs> another commonwealth yep country. um you know give me my diamond um but I know. send it back right now <laughs> just give us the diamond back um you know so we're talking about another quote-unquote commonwealth country because I I got a scholarship that dealt with commonwealth countries so then we were able to look at different um countries within that kind of area geo area which is the yeah. entire world because yeah. colonization yeah um so looking at, okay, well, how does that compare to the Canadian diaspora in the Indian diaspora? Like, what's the difference? So the major differences that we found was, okay, first of all, like taxes are dumb. So like, <laughs> that was not an option. And also there's like fat shaming in that, right? Like, it's like, oh, well, like the reason why we're taxing is the, this because like people are gaining weight. So like no more sugar sweetened beverages. Right. But if you look at what is considered a sugar sweetened beverage, Things like Boost, Onsure, nutritional supplements, those are considered sugar sweetened beverages as well in certain areas because, um, you know, they like there's like some some countries look at like, OK, well, if it has milk in it, it's not considered a sugar sweetened beverage. But then those tend to be the most sweet. So like, what are we doing? Yeah. But then there's like things in India where they don't have milk in them and they're considered a sugar sweetened beverage, but they're a nutritional supplement. Right. So like if you're not able to afford the food, but you can afford nutritional supplements, why would we tax that? Yeah. You tax those people more and then they may not be able to even afford that. Right. Then they can't eat anything. Yeah. Right. So like that was 
like the ultimate thing that we like came to the conclusion of in the research, but the other nuances are what actually is what got published. So like that's the stuff that got published of the like West is best rhetoric. So the stuff that comes out as like, oh, well, you know, the, actually the wealthier people in India are the ones with more chronic illnesses because they're actually eating more Westernized food. They've come away mm. from their own culture of foods, cultural yeah. foods. Right. And that just puts them into a spot of, okay, well, we're having more Western foods. We're having a more Western diet and we're having more processed foods. Well, and I see this firsthand in, so this is just casually not research, but my, everyone in my family and my generation was born in India, except for my cousin who was born in the U S and body size. We're all about the same size. She was bigger raised in America eating like Americans, like just naturally. Mm -hmm. The other thing I see now is my wealthier cousins in India are eating. Like when we went to visit last, I brought my husband, he's white. I was like, after our marriage, we went for our honeymoon. It was fantastic. We stayed at my cousins and their cook is like amazing, right? All the Indian food. I'm like, give me the Italy, give me the chapati, give me the everything. Mm -hmm. But then they were not eating that stuff for breakfast. Mm -hmm. and lunch. They were eating an omelet with cheese, cheese yeah. on everything. And like, I'm like, I'm not saying that those foods are unhealthy by any means, but that's not traditional Indian foods Yeah, and your bodies for generations are not used to eating like that every single day. And now you're giving yourself just that, or they would eat like even a dosa with like cheese. And I'm like, this is like yeah. blasphemy, right? Cause I'm South Indian and I'm like, yeah, and they, they are too, but it's the culture of, we can afford this stuff. We can afford pizza hut. We can afford Domino's. We can afford the, you know, the fast mm -hmm. food, because it is more expensive than like the it traditional Indian expensive. foods, but it's like almost like flaunting, like I can afford this now. So I'm going to eat this. Mm -hmm. But then and that's like totally in our culture, right? Is like, like think about like the things like Indians love jewelry, right? Yes. Like we just talked about the diamond. Like yeah. we just talk about that. <laughs> like we love our jewelry. So like we love to flaunt our wealth in some regard. So like flaunting our wealth with food is not an uncommon practice. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, you have a big party, your mom's going to throw out all the stuff. She's like, we're getting the copper dishes out. We're going to make sure everything's set up, get the burners, get this, get that. Like, we're going to make everything because yeah. flaunting our like giving of food because food is not just food in India and it's not food to anybody. Like it's food is everything. Yeah. It's, and like many cultures culture. are like this, like my Italian yeah. friends, Croatian friends, it's the same thing. Their moms mm -hmm. pull out like a whole, and I'm like, literally there's like five of us. Mm -hmm. And I feel, I actually feel bad when there's too much food. Cause I feel like it's wasted. And mm -hmm. it's, it's like, nobody needs to eat that much in one sitting, but it is part of the culture to like, yeah. we made it, we are wealthy enough to do this. Okay. So we're going to, yeah. Do it. Um, and you see that like in Indian cultures and then like, it's, it's known like here's my jewelry here's this here's that like, look at all my saris and you're like oh my god why <laughs> i'm like why do you have a stack and like suitcases full of indian clothes that you don't wear <laughs> like, it's the suitcases for me i'm like Mom, like at least display them so you can like look at how pretty it is <laughs> hidden in a suitcase She's under like, the bed one day in we'll the get them. <laughs> like they're, they're saved because one day they're going to be worth a lot it's like well you have like you know 18 varanasi silk saris like I don't know when you're going to be wearing these. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that like a uh, culture of uh, kind of display. Yes. And, you know, when we also like think about like Indians, like Hindus in particular, we pray and we give food to the deep. like we give them prashad, like we give them sweet. Um, so that is a big part of it. So if we're going to be looking at, you know, sweeteners and sugar and things like that as the quote unquote demon of all of this we're forgetting the actual practice of what sugar is in India so sugar in India is also this aspect of what's the first thing you do when you go to a person's house in India you get a cup of tea and a sweet no matter what no matter where you go so when I was living in the village there um, I was living in Tarwad which is a village quote um of 1.2 million people but it's India. <laughs> like it's India so like what's a village um in a population of a billion so relative it was a small. village yeah yes and it like had like very much like it was small very populated because like hello India very populated everywhere people living just on top of each other kind of thing um but 
every interview that I did, because it was qualitative. So I was looking at interviews. I interviewed like locals and uh, did like analysis of it. We don't have to get into the actual interview process, but every single place I went to, I was offered tea and sweets, no matter what. Like whether they were like a student, whether they were a professor, whether they lived in, you know, like they lived close to the Taba that was outside of where I was living, no matter what, tea and sweets. Yeah. Everywhere. I would go and like, be like, okay, I'm going to go like, go to this like vendor and like talk to them about like, cause they had a, co- they had a Pepsi, like, um, facility, like a bottling facility at the, like in Tarwad which is really random, but it's there. Um, if you ever get Pepsi in India, they're mostly bottled in Darwad. Um, Where, what state is that in? It's in Karnataka. Mm, okay. Yeah. So, um, and I'm North Indian. So like, and I look very North Indian. So like I go down there and they're like, North Indian. And I'm like, gee. <laughs> <laughs> and I speak Hindi, but like they don't, they speak Canada there. So it's like, I don't know how to speak the language. Yeah. I like, I, but they knew what I was saying. So it was easy for me to like bargain and get my way around things, which was good. Um, but anyways, going back to this like Pepsi thing. So we're at this Pepsi factory and I'm interviewing this guy and he just brings out like literally a tray of Matai. Like he's just like, <laughs> here. And I'm like, why? <laughs> like, I, I it's just the culture. Like, yeah. yeah. And you know, no, no Pepsi offered to me, but like, oh, interesting. Uh, my You're research at the Pepsi partner, factory, but no Pepsi, <laughs> no Pepsi. I got tea. Um, but my research partner who's white, Oh, do you want some Pepsi? And I'm like, Oh, wait, but I, want, I don't want Pepsi. <laughs> like, maybe I don't want some Pepsi. <laughs> like I'm done having, you're tea, like, I've like, had eight cups of chai today. Please give me a Pepsi. Please, <laughs> like give me, give me the Pepsi. Um, but no, he gives me tea. So there's also that, like, we called it the intervening variable in all of our interviews, because even if she was the one doing the interview, because we'd always tag team an interview, so either she's interviewing or I'm interviewing, if she was interviewing, they were talking to me. Because it was always this intervening variable of, oh, well, you're the Indian here. You get me. Yeah. And, like, my research partner, a very capable person, like, she's amazing. And... She was like, uh, can you talk? And I was like, you have to talk to her. Don't talk. I'm just writing. Don't talk to me. But they would talk to me, like to me because of that like, like the comfort. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like why, like I have a lot of Indian clients or like a lot of brown clients because they feel comfortable around me because we look the same. <laughs> well, and it's also, I feel like a byproduct of colonization. You have less yeah, trust for exactly. white people because of exactly what happened in India and all over the world. So you know, I, I see that too, because my parents, when we moved here, they were 40 and 45 and they have only Indian friends mm-hmm. and like their coworkers that were Indian, they're their friends. Right. And it's this lack of trust for people who are different because I mean, it makes sense. It's like, we see it in the black community too. Right. It's like, yeah, you have to prove your yourself to me <laughs> by sticking around long enough by earning that trust. So I can see that. I can see that even with my clients too. Um, yeah. And you also understand the cultural aspects of the food. Like mm-hmm. you don't have to explain what dal is when you like, yeah. you know, or like Rajma or whatever. It's just like, yeah, your, your clients are probably like, oh, you're just going to get it. I don't have to. Explain yeah. Or they say, oh yeah, I'm making sabzi today. And I'm like, okay. Like I already, like, I'm like, what kind of sabzi? Like I, you don't have to explain like the process of what making is it? sabzi. What's like, it? it's yeah. like, like, I already know what the base is. Just tell me which vegetable you're going to put in there. Yeah. You know, like what, what like, do I already know what you're going to do to it. Just like, tell me what you're like going to put in there. <laughs> like, cause I don't really, like, I already know what's going to happen. So, yeah. and then they're like, oh, well, yeah, we made a tarka. And I'm like, okay, yeah. Like, there's no question about like, what's in the tarka. I'm like, no, no, I know. And I'm like, wait, oh, you're South Indian. Do you put mustard seeds in there? Like, <laughs> like, is that what you're putting in there? Cause like, us North Indian uh, so we, eat. we put the cumin. Yeah, we put the cumin seeds. So it's like, yeah. I, and again, living in South India, I had that experience and exposure like I can make a wicked dosa so I'm like I'm ready now (laughs) (laughs) um but it was because I had that exposure which was again 
I felt like I wasn't culture shocked when I went to India. Mm. But when I came back, I was like, holy, what's going on here? Like, first mm. of all, where are the people? There's no people here. And then <laughs> <laughs> second of all, um, everybody eats out all the time. Like in the here, village, people, yeah, ah. people weren't eating out in the village. But then like my cousins in Delhi, like one of my cousins is a chef. So like she's taking me all these restaurants and stuff. And I'm just like, this is amazing. But lots of people eat out. But in the village, people are like, no, no, no. Um, like we, I was going to say, gar kakana. Like it's like they eat at home. At home food, like, yeah. yeah, like at home. Like that's their that's their vibe. Because they live where they live. Yeah. And you go to the larger city centers and you're like, oh, like this is why. And then those are where you see the more influx of diabetes and hypertension. And like, it's it's just like so apparent. I see it too. I see it in all my cousins in the big cities and they're struggling with their health, especially now they're getting into the menopause and they're (laughs) like, Oh shit. For the past 20 years, I've been eating out every day. And like their work days are like 12 hours, you know, like they work, like they're all work horses. Yeah. And it's the culture, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. we have to work all day and then on weekends too. And so they just don't have time to cook or they don't have, they're not home enough. Um, and a lot of the processed food is not Indian processed food either. It's like no other cultures foods that Western, right? Western. Yeah. It's Western yeah. Foods. So, and like, even just reframing, it's just more convenient. Mm, so yeah. yeah. Cause like when we look at like, cause the, again, the shame and blame. So like, just like, Hey, no, it's not crap. It's just more convenient. Yeah. It fits their lifestyle. So like just looking at that perspective, uh, when we go through that, like, Indian perspective right like Indians are workhorses like when they're in India I'm like how are you still working and they're like yeah I work like you know nine and then I I work until 2 a.m I'm like what like yeah but that's just reality (laughs) well and we know how important sleep is in terms of health too and Mm -hmm. I often diabetes and diabetes and Mm -hmm. you know it's it's the combination of the convenience (laughs) foods the lack of sleep the high stress life but people just blame it on like one thing or their weight, mm-hmm. right? It's like, but yeah. like, what is it about really? Yeah, um, exactly. And that, again, they, that shame and blame is coming from the diet culture. And, um, you know, even in Indian society, this idea of, well, you have to look a certain way. Like you have to look like Ashwarya. You can't look like Madhuri because like, you know, Madhuri is short and like Ashwarya is tall and like you she's know she's got green eyes or whatever yeah. got green eyes she's got the like quote-unquote Aryan features even though she's South Indian like that's you have to look like that that's how we perceive beauty right. um and that comes again like that like filtered into from the 80s and 90s and now it's just kind of there um and it sits there and you see you know oh well fair skin is more beautiful and that stuff is again from this western rhetoric Yes. Of oh well the Westerners they're more wealthy they have all these big power so they're more beautiful yeah. and it's crazy because you also see this in um like cleaning stations so like in India there's lots of cleaning stations you go to like a like mother you mean you know, oh I see, I see I see okay yeah, yeah, you go yeah, to yeah, the mother yeah. and there's like for your hands um in lots of like different villages they have like these like hand washing stations to like go before you eat you like wash your hands because everything you eat with your hands or like you after you eat you go and wash your hands so they have these like little like kind of posters above the hand washing station of the um how to wash your hands and it's not Indian people that are featured there it's white people white blonde people so what does that perceive like intrinsically it's like oh well white people are clean and dark people are not yeah they're dirty right yeah they're dirty or they're poor or they're not able to keep themselves clean and that's a problem right because then you see this like internalized racism that comes in not just from like indian to indian but indian to like darker populations like black people oh yeah you see it um and even south indian to north indian like the north indians like we're crazy up there like (laughs) we're we're crazy people so like because we're just like oh no like they're down there they're darker but then south indian people are like oh no you're not pure indian (laughs) it's it's a whole thing and it's like 
because I got told that so many times when I was there I was like oh no you're North Indian you wouldn't understand you're not truly an Indian and it's like well no I'm not I'm a Canadian they're like no 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 but you're North Indian and I'm like like give me some space here like I'm none of these things (laughs) I'm like I'm trying to just be Canadian in India and that's what the rhetoric I was getting while I was in that South Indian community um because I look very North Indian like I look like a Punjabi girl so like yeah it's very clear um not that like obviously like everybody looks different but like I have very distinct features (laughs) um that that pushed me in that space and also like I dress like I'm a western person like I wasn't wearing like Sorry, and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was like forty-seven degrees out there. I'm not gonna do that. I can't wear that much fabric. Like, <laughs> going into an interview, I'm like, nope, not doing that. Nope. Like, obviously, I'm not gonna wear shorts because that's just asking for trouble. But like, I got boobs, so like, what am I gonna do? Yeah, you're like, <laughs> like I can't hide this stuff. I'm just like, I'm trying. As- I'm trying my best to hide it. Like, I can't walk around in a sweater. Sorry, my boobs are out. Like, what am I gonna do? I'm just kind of. Like in this spot where I didn't look like I belonged there, in. yeah. But everybody thought I belonged there. They thought I was my research partner's tour guide. Okay, so this happened with my husband and I. They thought I was his tour guide, yeah. and I actually went with it for one time just because I wanted to see if I could get the Indian discount to get into the museum. And like, well, I say this, I want to say this. That was really ridiculous because it's the difference between like a dollar or two dollars like really minimal but I just wanted to see if they still thought of me as Indian and they did because yeah when I was traveling around Rajasthan I ha- I just said I was Tamilian and that's why I didn't speak Hindi that well because I speak Hindi but very poorly now mm-hmm. I've just forgotten so much and so they were like oh you're you're from Mumbai because that's where I, fr- I was born and uh, and then I'm like, oh, but my Hindi, I forgot. And, you know, I, I speak Tamil. Uh, and so they were, they just assumed that, I, which is true, but they just assumed that I was taking him around on a tour because they just yeah. saw me as Indian. They didn't see him as Indian, obviously. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because I am South Indian, but because I'm lighter skinned and my mom is really light skinned. People often mm-hmm. wonder like, how the heck is she South Indian? And I'm like, I don't know. We just are. Um, I Ashwarya. <laughs> yeah, right. There's just no I Ashwarya. No green eyes, but like we're just lighter, <laughs> especially for South Indians, right? Yeah. My dad, my brother are darker, and when I grew up, I never saw the colorism mm-hmm. because I was lighter skinned. But yeah. and I was I was like eight when I left India. I lived in Bahrain until I was ten, so I don't. I wasn't a teenager going through that. But now, as an adult, I can see it. And mm-hmm. the fair and lovely commercials, the like, like you said, and the posters. I noticed that yeah. a lot of the billboards were just like white people, and I'm like, they're trying to sell because they know that people will buy. Because yeah. again, white supremacy worldwide, right? Yay, they, colonialism. Just, colonialism is <laughs> the lie that we've been fed that white is better. It still mm-hmm. persists in India, so colorism, all of that stuff, still exists, and that affects probably food and health long term, right? Yes. And you see that not in just the chronic illness wise, but like, oh, well, when people move here, yes. well, yeah, I'm going to just have Western food because that's considered healthy because you're, we're in the West. They're healthy people. Yeah. We're unhealthy people. Oh, and, and then you get the, oh, like, I got this a lot growing up was, well, your food's really greasy. It's not very good for you. It's got a lot of fat in it. There's no vegetables in it. I'm like, have you made a tarka? Like there's literally four vegetables just in the tarka alone. Like just like in the base of all the foods, there's four vegetables. Yeah. Vegetable heavy food. Huge. And it's, it's we are it's all we vegetable it's all we, protein and then rice or like yeah, protein, like right? It's, like yeah. it's, it's like it's that's, so healthy. I know. And like I always tell people, when you eat out, of course there's gonna be more grease and cream, but they're also catering to a Western audience who likes that heavier, sweeter, you know, taste. Creamier, like creamier, richer. Like yeah. I never ate like that at home. South Indian food, especially it's like mostly vegan, except for the ghee and like sweets and stuff. Mm-hmm. But like there's a lot of vegetarian foods. We don't really eat a lot. eggs. And so it's it's not heavy fats, it's not heavy no. grease. But you're right. There's this myth. And it's unfortunate because when I moved to Canada, I was 10 and the principal gave my parents the Canada food guide. Yeah. And we're like, oh, was so like, fun. your daughter needs to be eating like this. And because I was so small, 
I should have been actually starting grade six because I started school a year early in India. So I mm-hmm. could have started grade six, but they kept me back in grade five with my age group because I was so small. And I'm like, but I'm just small. I'm not going to just You're grow like, I'm smart though. <laughs> oh, I didn't learn anything new in Canada until I was in grade nine because the school yeah. system is so far advanced there. And so different. like, you just don't learn anything here. You just, I was cutting and pasting in grade yeah. five. I was literally collecting leaves and making it like, I was shocked, but that's yeah. besides the point. But I, I definitely noticed that like there was this heavy pressure to eat a lot of dairy. Oh, she mm-hmm. needs to be drinking three to four cups of milk a day. Like, I don't know about you, but like we don't in India, nobody does that. Right. Like you're nobody not drinks milk. just like milk, but they put milk in two things. Cereal right? or like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's not like, oh yeah, here, have a glass of milk. It's like, pardon like it's like oh you're sick so you have milk that's why you have milk it's like oh like they have a cold you put milk and turmeric and turmeric and yeah and like saccharin and whatever else yeah I've been drinking that daily with plant-based milk because my kids don't eat dairy so it's just um yeah it's it's this assumption that the western culture and diet is the best way Mm -hmm. and parents are being told this by school like teachers and principals. Yeah. I had a client whose who's, um, teacher <laughs> said that you must bring a vegetable with each uh, <laughs> meal or snack. I was like, who is snacking on veggies at, like as a five-year-old? Like, you know, like it's okay if they do, but it's also okay if they don't. And, you know, when we see that, now we're like seeing that infliction of diet culture into our children, right? Yeah. So that infliction comes from like, who is the principal? Like, is he a dietitian? Is he a healthcare professional? What's his nutrition training? I always ask that to my clients when they're like, yeah, my, my teacher or my prof told me X. And I'm like, what's your, what, what class was that? They're like social economics. And I'm like, lovely. I'm so glad that they're so qualified. And I think that, that maybe you don't have to eat just like one bread one piece of toast every single day like that's like definitely not healthy Um, (laughs) it's not enough food Um, (laughs) please eat more and please like please I beg you eat more it's so funny like I think whenever my clients meet me they think I'm gonna like put them on a restrictive situation and I'm usually like we should add this what about this add this and they're like you're just adding more foods into my life and I'm like yes that's what I want you to do because that's how you find freedom and that's how we figure out like oh, you can actually tolerate this, especially with like things like IBS and Crohn's Yeah, I wanted to ask about that because I know I've worked with people who are are like, oh, I can't eat anything because I have IBS. So I just Mm -hmm. eat like literally like plain bread and like very minimal. (sighs) Yeah. And I'm like, is that true? Like, no. Yeah. No, I have a few really intense colitis patients. And yeah, when they came to me, they were just having white food. So like bread, potatoes, um pasta, plain yeah. pasta like yeah. plain pasta they're Indian okay they're coming oh. to me with this and they're <laughs> like yeah I have plain pasta bread and aloo and I'm like okay how's that going they're like it's awful <laughs> like, I'm like, it sounds like that really that's bad. an immediate immediate depression for me when I don't eat so after I had my first because I had breastfeeding issues my naturopath told me to stop eating gluten dairy and eggs I'm already vegetarian so I'm like okay you are literally taking my life like when you take gluten away like everything everything (laughs) and I became real thin I was so my mental health was tanking because I wasn't getting any nutrients I literally was not eating enough and I started to get more stressed and it it was just a cycle right so many healthcare professionals their first thing is to restrict take away all eliminate take away yeah. And I love your approach that you're like, no, let's let's add. add it in. So like with that client that comes to me like, ah, I have alu. And I'm like, okay, that's it. Okay. It's like a potato. Um, and then I'm like, okay, like, let's try like something else. And then slowly adding in, adding in, adding in. And now like, she eats everything. She's like, awesome. yeah, my, like, I ate like a, like Jana masala the other day. And I'm like, with colitis, like you had Jana, like chickpeas. Yeah, which is a huge trigger for most people. And she was like, "Yeah, I had John and all last night." And I'm like, "You go, girl." That's awesome, you go, girl. If but I ever like, had to give up John and Masala, whoo! <laughs> last night, I would like, I would not be able to do that. Like, no, but no. it's like, like I eat primarily plant based and vegetarian. Like I eat fish every once in a while, basically when I go out. So it's so difficult for me to like give up 
something. Cause I'm like, I, this is how I get my nutrition. This yeah. is how I survive. Yeah. I would not be able to work if I didn't eat things. Yeah. Um, and I think that like, when we look at that restrictive eating pattern, we're just, sorry for the pun, we're feeding diet culture. We're just letting that big monster take over our life Lives. essentially yeah. and being the dictator of our life rather than us having that relationship. It's like, oh, well, someone else is in that relationship with diet culture because like we don't get to have a relationship with our food. Right. How I do you respond think- to, I'm just thinking of you yeah. and like your friends, I, like maybe you have all your friends are on board, but what about if you have friends, cousins, family that make inappropriate comments or not even inappropriate, but like diet culture comments. Yeah. Cause I have young kids and I'm like very protective <laughs> of what they hear at home or around home. But then I know mm-hmm. that I don't have control over what they hear outside of home and yeah. in their daycare, they're very congratulatory when you finish your meal. <gasps> and yeah. my daughter will come home and say, and say, I finished my lunch today. And I never say, yay, congrats. I'm always like, oh, you know, looks like your belly, your body needed that. Mm -hmm. But their daycare is like, gold star, you're awesome. You finished everything. And so she has learned (laughs) that she wants that encouragement and that, you know, like the gold star, not actually getting a star, but like that congratulatory experience. So she now like rushes to finish it. And I'm like, Trust take your, your body, time. Take your time. Trust your body. Yeah, yeah. But it's this message that very few people are on board with, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And it's a constant conversation that we're having with daycare and whatnot. But what do you do if you have are out for dinner with friends and someone's like, oh, I can't order dessert because, you know, my way. Yeah. Do you respond? So do you just, yeah. My usual response to this, I've like really converted a lot of my friends to like not talk about their weight in front of me because I'm just like, you know, like, I think that we need to re-examine how we look at our bodies. They're like, oh, I can't have dessert because it's not my cheat day. Or like, I oh, yeah. say like, I'm like, oh my God, cheat day. I like, want to just, please, you're not cheating on yourself. Um, <laughs> like You're, you're cheating only- yourself if you're not eating dessert that you really like, wanted. You're, you're not cheating on your relationship right now. Like, please, like, just eat it. Um, I, so my friends don't really comment about it anymore because I've like really just kind of shut it down real quick so like for example if they're like oh I can't have that because like it's just so fattening I'll be like it's probably delicious though so like you're definitely going to miss out and then I usually like accidentally order that menu item (laughs) I think that was kind of my response to that Uh, at one point I was just like I'll just order it and like eat it and then they're like oh can I have some and I'm like yeah I think you should and just giving them again, freedom to try. Now, when it comes to those self-deprecating comments, I really adamant about like, let's just like talk about our body nicely. Mm -hmm. Um, So let's circle back to my mom, who like is like my guinea pig patient, (laughs) (laughs) my guinea pig patient. Who best to start with, right? (laughs) Right. I'm like, you fed me, now let me feed your mind. Um, (laughs) So uh, I, I really like, shifted her perspective on diet culture and I heard it actually she was talking to my nani my my uh, maternal grandmother she's talking to her because my nani's doctor keeps saying oh well like you know you're you're too heavy you're too this and like my nani's first of all four foot eleven maybe even smaller like she's tiny tiny little lady and like she's been the same weight for like for the last like 20 years. Wow. Yeah. That's doctor awesome. Doctor saying, yeah, like she's like, she's, she does yoga every day. She's 89. Like, just like let her be like, yeah. at this point. Like she's on four medications. That's it. For an 89 year old, the average, like, I think at the average after 65 is like 11 medications. Oh, what? Yes. So 11. On, oh my gosh. Yeah. And she's on four. No wonder my mom, my mom always says she's so healthy because she's not on any meds. Yeah. She's, 66 yeah yeah so okay. like I'll give her credit now four, yeah <laughs> right like yeah. she's on four yeah. so like this little lady's very like she's got her stuff going okay the doctor's telling her oh well like you know you're too heavy and I'm like uh, and then my nanny calls me Annika I actually would really like you to put me on a diet and I'm like what are you talking about and then my mom chirps in and says mom your body is beautiful. And I'm like, oh, like I That's start so... like, just like, yeah, mom, you go girl. Like 
because my mom you're like my work here is done (laughs) yeah I literally like was like mom I'm so proud I like just completely just put my nanny's comment aside and was like mom you have like you are a star student because she used to like agree and be like oh yeah that's a good idea like we'll listen to your doctor but now my mom's more like why your body's beautiful like look at how much you've done with your body and she's talking yeah and she and like look at you you're 89 and you're doing all these things and I'm like wow like just full heart eyes for my mom just like you just like blew my world right here um just by even like saying those things because she was always self-deprecating like even up until I want to say like the last like year and when she came out with that, I was just like, wow, like this is a whole other ball game now. And now like my mom's like talking about her body in a positive way. Like, cause she was my biggest trigger, I think for like yes. understanding diet culture. Cause like whose mom isn't yeah. like yeah. at the end of the day, like, yeah. sorry, moms, like it's very important for you guys to take care of your children and like watch what you say around them. Cause they will learn. Um, but like hearing my mom say that was like, like I was mind blown, like blasted. My mind was blasted. You know what? And it goes to show though, that any, for anyone listening, who's dealing with the same thing with their own mothers, maybe you're working through diet culture yourself and you're, mm-hmm. you're like, Oh, anytime I have family gatherings, my mom or parents or family is making inappropriate comments around me or my children just Mm -hmm. supposed to show how long it takes to change though it's not like an overnight one conversation thing you may need to have these set these boundaries have these conversations ongoing ongoing so that the Mm -hmm. they get it because my 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 mother-in-law you know oh I've got to lose weight and she's already like just average I'm like you don't need to oh I just I'll you know if I just lose another five pounds I'm gonna I'm like your body's perfect the way it is yeah and like what is with this obsession of losing weight? Like you're not going to be happier at five pounds less. Like that's, I think the message doesn't change anything. It does not change anything. And Uh, like, I think that kind of brings it back to like, oh, well, their physician is telling them that they have to lose weight. And it's based on this like BMI aspect of things. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. It's like this BMI of OX means that you're healthy in quotes, like please take that with a grain of salt. Your BMI does not dictate those things. It literally just looks at your weight and your height. So like, yeah, guess what? My four foot nine nani at like whatever weight she's at, her BMI is going to be really high because she's like a, she's four foot nine yeah. and like weighs as much as me. Like, yeah. Well, and so, it doesn't take into consideration muscle mass, bone, like body no, frame size. Not nothing. And like or age, right? Or age. And like I think like it doesn't take into consideration age. And now like when we see that, um, like even just working in long-term care, like my residents that are in my long-term care home that are in very frail bodies, like they're very thin, um, and like they're losing weight rapidly, guess what? They tend to die really quickly. Like, sorry for talking so morbidly, but like they they die very quickly. Whereas my residents that, you know, are like a little bit heavier, they're like, you know, just doing them. If they are in the exact same condition, they have the exact same, uh, you know, um, comorbidities, the resident that is heavier will live longer. Do better. Yeah. They will live longer, like hands down. Yeah. And it's because they have a little extra something, something on them regardless of their BMI, they got something to fight whatever's going to happen to them. Yeah. Especially if you like have a stomach bug and you're not eating, Mm -hmm. you need Mm -hmm. extra reserves. Right. And I think people forget that like fat and extra stores are not a bad thing. It's actually survival, right? Like our bodies are surviving. And I remember when we had the uh, IG live, you had talked about BMI and what is it body that's body mass index for those of you yeah. who know but I think most people do what is it based on and is there validity to it or is it is there any good in it so the BMI is like it comes from I think he's a astrologer or a statistician it was like this formula that was built um in the 18th 
1800s. Yeah. And this guy just comes up with this formula because he's actually trying to figure out the like pull of the earth circle on the star. It was like a whole astrology statistician sort of thing. Um, but then that formula kind of stuck and American insurance, <clears throat> sorry, American insurance companies actually picked that up in mm, the like convenient 1950- yeah. yeah they're like oh great we'll use it yeah um, <laughs> the night 19 late, late 1940s uh 50s and like Ansel Keys who's like a big like researcher in nutrition and like honestly he's like I would say he's like one of those founders of diet culture um because he okay, comes up with this oh yes we can use this formula for all these things and he was working with the insurance companies to see the health of people wow um and like obviously like if you've ever read like the minnesota starvation experiments and things like that like he uses the bmi as this marker now the bmi was used and developed like for white 35 year old men i don't fit there you don't fit there like my partner doesn't fit there. My mom doesn't fit there. My nanny doesn't fit there. My dad doesn't fit there. My sister, my brother, all these people don't fit in that category. Why are we using that? Yeah. Where's the validity in something that's like research that's only based on one population? Yeah. So like, even if we want to talk about my research, I looked at Indian populations. I looked at indigenous populations here in Canada. I'm looking at all of these populations and seeing what the difference is or if there's similarities. So we need a bigger sample size to actually see the validity of this. If we're only using, you know, eight, eight, it's like over hundred year old research. <laughs> like let's update that. Yeah. Um, and our lifestyles have changed so much since then. It's a complete, yeah, like, we eat very differently. We eat exactly. very differently. Yeah. Like this is, he's talking about meat and potatoes kind of society. Yeah. Um, uh, hello, like are Indians meat and potatoes society? No. So like, why is that used? when we assess like different cultured people it shouldn't be used yeah it shouldn't be used when we assess all women but it's yeah. used it's used so all the time that like validity question is like i don't think it's valid at all yeah like it has no validity and again it doesn't consider all of the other factors like it doesn't consider okay well like people that are pregnant also get their bmi checked <laughs> Like, hello, they're growing another human inside them. Um, <laughs> like, let's just like, let's just that. stop. I know. I'm like, let's just stop <laughs> weighing pregnant women, first of all, because right? it's like, been shown time and time again that it has nothing to do with your size of your baby. Your like, nothing. it has nothing to do with it. So, like, that's out the window. Okay. So, like, pregnant people are out. What about the women? Okay, none of the none of the people that were tested during the statistician's research were women. And like okay, questionable what? too what the research methods were back then. You know, it's like right? Like what is he weighing them on like a yeah, like a, a teeter scale or something? Yeah. Like it's like a, what were you weighing them on? Like yeah. how do you know I what know. they and, actually And were? the fact that doctors, hospitals, healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. fitness pros are still using this is, yeah. it goes to show how long it takes for bad information to then like lead out of the culture. Right. Yeah. And we have to do our parts as professionals, yeah. but as a, as a regular person who may be seeking help, if your doctor, these are red flags for me. If your doctor is heavily yeah. weighing again, pun intended, if heavily weighing just your weight for everything, everything is excused or the excuse for everything is your weight. I'm sorry, but you might need to go find a new doctor who can actually help you stay healthy and not just give you state random. I'm like, you're just observing that this person has fat. That's not telling you anything, yeah. right? It's it's like saying, oh, it's your height. That's the problem. What? Thanks. Yeah. Um, when, you know, like for myself, we're going to, again, circle back to the boobs. Guess what? I've got. Oh, true. Boobs, right. Yeah. So now I'm dealing with this, like, well, you're, if I would like go and actually get like a, a DEXA scan, which I have before, just because I was curious and also was a part of research, whatever. Yeah. Anyways, it was cool because I was able to actually see my, my fat, fat like, content, yeah. fat content, I saw my bone density. It was like really cool. And oh, like, actually very cool. Me, yeah, like it's like, it's a really cool um, scan that you can get done. Um, it like is an x-ray with 
the idea of actually looking at what you have on you mm. um, without actually looking at like, cause there's the other ones like the aim body and stuff like that, that look at electromagnetic current through fat, through fat and uh, muscle. But the DEXA actually is like an x-ray that goes through and looks at it. So it's really, really cool. Anyways, guess what? My fat content is going to be so much higher than everybody else because I got big boobs. So I'm like sitting there with my big that, boobs. And I'm that's like, 10 pounds right there. Yeah. <laughs> like, thank you. Like, you know, there, there's, there's all the fat right there. Like, thank you. That's where it is. Like, yeah. um, because it's there. So like, that's not even considered. That's so when true. We're They're not studying it. female bodies, to be honest. They just, no. you know, no. it's, and I, I really think that when we look at our own body image, and if there's so many people postpartum, right? Mm-hmm. I want to get back to exercise. I'm like, it's not about the exercise. You want to get back to looking how you did before, because you think that will solve all of your problems. It's not going to solve mm-hmm. your sleep deprivation. It's not going to, it's not going to um, make you feel better about being a mom, new mom, trying to figure everything out. It's not going to make your baby stop crying at night. Mm-hmm. going back to your body for people, it's freedom, right? It's like, ah, oh, I feel pretty or I feel attractive. Yeah. But the reality is it's not, it's a deeper conversation and mm-hmm. it's about so much more than just their body size, yeah. right? It's their internalized messaging about their worth related to their body size and mm-hmm. um, size giving people apparently happiness, which is not true. I'm like, I, I tell people, I'm like, I used to be a hundred pounds, size zero, size two, my entire life. I'm, I'm now, I'm not going to name my size and stuff, but like, I'm much heavier now. I'm much happier. Mm-hmm. Like it's, and it like, has, I, getting back to that size will not bring me more happiness. If yeah, it happens, and it happens, but it's not going to. When we look at like the idea of this idealistic body for a woman, that is in the eyes of a man. Yeah. And, and a white I man. think that's in a white man, right? Like, um, we look at, you know, what the standard of beauty is and all of these beauty companies, all of these lingerie companies that like have women's bodies all over it are owned and operated by men. So when just like we, gross, <laughs> it's disgusting. It's disgusting. Um, but we look at that and that becomes the standard of beauty. That's what we consider beautiful yeah. in the eyes of a man. Yeah. So that's just like a, a deep conversation of diet culture is like, well, we're living in misogyny ultimately, mm-hmm. right? It's like, well, all of these standards of beauty for women are for men, which is like it's not for us it's for them and it's just reminding ourselves we don't exist for men we exist for ourselves right? exactly like, and men don't get these same judgment if they, uh, you see all the men with you know they've got their belly sticking out nobody's asking them are you pregnant oh did you you yeah. seem to have put on weight there's no comments and body shaming no. and maybe there is but maybe in a few families but by and large it's happening to women yeah and we we don't even see ourselves represented on tv and media as women of color we rarely see ourselves represented and then you add to that when we are represented it's usually thin light-skinned brown women right yeah who are aesthetically pleasing for the gaze of a white man right so yeah. it's it kind of comes back to that yeah and like I do want to touch on like men do have like disordered eating patterns and eating disorders in their own regard they're just not diagnosed right like yeah how do you unquote, see the men like well with the gym bros mm. right they're counting oh. calories they're counting their macros they're counting right. everything out they're always looking at the numbers because they're trying to compartmentalize food rather than having a relationship with food that's free yeah so there is disordered eating patterns there right and like that's not sustainable that's yeah. not healthy like yeah. seeing food is oh well like i got to get my macros in it's like pardon i don't like, even know what that means <laughs> So like, it's like food, you want to get food. You want to understand, you want to have food. Right. Um, and they're like, no, my macros. And I'm like, food is not like, you're just, we can't just divide food up like that. Yeah. Yeah. So like, that's a disordered eating pattern right there. So men have it too. And I think that like men also have this aspect of, okay, well, I have to look like a superhuman, like a buff dude, like a, a superhero in order to be attractive. 
right? And I think that that is very harmful too. And like when we're raising our children, especially young boys, like they see that as like, oh, well, I have to be big and strong in order to be like successful. You know what? I see it a lot in mom groups. Like, oh, my son is so small. I'm just, it's, mm. it's this obsession when their son is too small and their daughter mm. is too big. Yeah. Right. It's like, exactly. And I see it. People will be, ah, uh, any advice on how to, yeah, you know, increase his weight. And I'm like, but he's healthy. You've just said he's healthy. Doctor's not worried. Yada, yada. But he's just fifth percentile. And I'm like, someone's got to be in the fifth percentile. Doesn't like, mean he's Why can't they just be there and like be okay with it? So I think that like, when we like women get this like it's so apparent for us but there's nuances for men too that I think that really need to to be like recognized and they also need to be acknowledged right like it's like all of these things are pointed at us is that because a lot most of the time we don't get studied right like all of the like recommendations all of the like dietary reference uh intake numbers like everything for vitamins and minerals they're all based for men all of your blood work the ranges they're all based for men yeah so now like taking that out okay like yes women have a lot of problems we don't get to have a lot of things in the medical field because nothing's studied for us but we can't not recognize the fact that men also are very influenced by diet culture um and And misogyny affects them too yes Yay. So because diet culture and misogyny, they kind of go hand in hand, right? So they, they live in the same box together. They're in the same box of things that if they're on your desk, you should probably start leaving with them (laughs) out, like just get them out of a, they're in the throwaway, the throwaway pile of that. It impacts relationships, especially Mm -hmm. when whatever your, you know, the gender of your partner is, if you are trying to separate yourself, but then they're counting their calories and macros and obsessing Mm -hmm. about eating 300 grams of protein a day, it's going to impact you too, right? Like it's, it's going to impact you too. So I think that becomes more challenging in, um, partnerships or relationships where one of you is mm-hmm. on board and one of you isn't. So where can people find you and work with you? Uh, so they can find me on our website, which is nourishingbalance.ca. I'll share they that. They can also uh, find me on social media. It's at nourishingbalance.peskyveggies. And um, if they want to work with me, there's a bunch of links on there. There's also a bunch of links on the website in order to Perfect. work with me. Um, and I have a pretty open schedule most of the time, sometimes. Um, and you just have to make sure that you catch me at a good time so when I can book you in and you can do like free discovery calls. You can get to know me a little bit better or you can just listen to the podcast. And I was going to say, if they've listened to your podcast, me. they're probably already like, I love her. How can I work <laughs> with her? I, I, I actually do recommend like this is, we're living in the future. Like people, mm-hmm. we have people who are experts Hello. in this field <laughs> who understand you, your culture. Obviously you can work with people who are not just Brown. You can work with everybody, but yes. what a lot of people don't understand is that if you're white, you can go to almost anyone. They'll understand your food, but if you're mm-hmm. Brown, you can't just go to anyone. Yeah. You'll have to do a lot of explaining. So it is a huge, um, I think it's a huge asset that you understand and, um, I think that's, that's so important. I'm so glad that you offer your services to people who need it. Uh, I have a few questions for you about yeah. yourself. Can you tell me about a book or a podcast that has been life-changing for you? What do you listen to? Oh, uh, so you I, listen to read? <laughs> yeah, I, yes, I do. Um, I actually listen to audiobooks. That's like my, oh, nice. my vibe. So it's kind of like a podcast and a book at the same time. Um, I think like during my internship, Anti Diet by Christy Harrison was one of my like most eye opening books that I've ever experienced. I was just like, oh my gosh, like you just slapped everything I ever knew in the face and <laughs> gave me an understanding of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, it was a huge eye opener. So if you can listen to it, um, I think I got mine on Audible, uh, but like the book is also very good. Like obviously, because the audiobook is the same thing as the book, but like if you can read it, does, go does for she it. Read it? The she reads it. She I reads feel like it, the so. books that where the author yeah. reads it, it's like, I want to listen to them read their book. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they have like a lot more like, you know, there's a passion, passion. that you feel yeah. in it. Yeah, it's yeah. not some random like automated voice reading it. 
Yeah. So I definitely recommend uh, her book, Anti Diet by Christy Harrison. Again, she's a dietitian. She's um, also an MPH. So she's got like a lot of knowledge on public health as well as dietetics. She also has a podcast, but I honestly, I love the book so much. That was my, like, again, life changing book Very cool. slash podcast at the same time. <laughs> awesome. Um, where, what do you do for yourself every day in terms of like three little things that you do for self-care or just to care for yourself? Um, so I am like really big on breakfast, like to the point where it's like, I will like make myself late. So I like have to have breakfast every morning, like no matter what. And my favorite breakfast is like cereal, <laughs> but I like add a bunch of things in there. I'm like, oh, I got to get like extra protein. So I'll, because cereal doesn't have a lot of protein. So I'm like, okay, I'll add Greek yogurt into there. I'll put berries. Oh. So I get fiber and like add some hemp hearts and just like make this like whole thing. But then I'll put milk in it. Cause I'm like, well, I want it to be cereal. I don't want it to be a parfait because like yeah. parfaits are not the same. Yeah. Um, and I'm huge on that. So that's like my number one thing that I do for myself every single day, no matter what. Um, like even when I'm traveling, I will like bring cereal with me if I have to. <laughs> like I'm, they I'm open crazy. your suitcase and it's just corn. There's some, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, there's what's cereal. your favorite cereal. Um, I like any granola, honestly. I like love granola and love like, granola too. like all of it, like any type, like it's honestly kind of embarrassing. Like, I'm just like, yeah, I'm a big cereal person. <laughs> like I won't eat eggs. I won't eat anything else for breakfast. It's like cereal. Yes. That's what I eat. That's so convenient. Um, and, and you're spicing it tasty. up with other things. It's, it's yeah, it's awesome. It's and tasty. what else, what else do you like? Um, to oh, what else do I do? Uh, I do like <laughs> cuddle my dog a lot mainly because it's like something that I like does give me a lot of joy and yeah. I think that's something that like even during the pandemic because I got him right before it was like he was my number one and just like making sure that I like give him love and attention so I think like giving him that is really important to me and then something else that I think I do every single day is like just like self-care stuff like making sure that I wash my face and like brush my teeth and it makes me really happy like just like flossing and doing that it's just the little like one things of my, right because you're it's like, like one of my like teeth things like I'm like I need to make sure my teeth are good because you only get one set so like I'm like pretty intense about it so I like floss every day and it just like makes me really happy <laughs> same I never used to and then I started getting so many cavities and I was like all right now I do not miss a day. Even if I'm exhausted, I wake up and I floss it's and brush my teeth. But like, yeah, yeah. Some people just don't ever floss and never get cavities. And I'm like, I'm not one of you people. I know. I, I know. And it's like, definitely just something that I like to do, but like yes. keeps me happy. Keeps you happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, love it. And I also love that you start your day with breakfast every day because so many people, I used to skip breakfast for my like entire life, basically Crazy. until more recently where I'm like, Hmm, why do I do this? What's more important yeah. than like sitting and just eating, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And like, again, cereal, like forces you to like sit down and eat. Yeah. Like you can't just grab a sandwich and a wrap yeah. or whatever and go. I like, love it's that like, too. no, I'm like, I like sit down and I like eat. It's like a, just like a huge part of my morning routine. Like I've been doing it for years. Like it's just, just who I am. I don't know. It's like a big part. Everybody that knows me is like, oh, Annika's having breakfast. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. I'm like really into breakfast. <laughs> okay. So what are you super passionate about right now? Ah, uh, this was my hardest question. I was like, I'm passionate about so many things. Um, right now I'm working on like a few corporate workshops for different organizations. And I Very think cool. that it's been really cool just because I can do those workshops in person. So yes. I'm like back to presenting and doing that in person. And I think like, I'm just like really digging that. Like I love the whole online pandemic presentation, but like doing it in person is so different. Like you get a vibe from the, the energy that are watching you. Yeah. Especially and, with, with presentations, right? Like mm -hmm. it's a little different when you're like one-on-one, -on -one, but when you're presenting to a room and you can see yeah. their expressions and they're not hiding behind a closed screen, you're like, yeah. Yeah. It's and really I like, I'm, I really like right now, it's like something that I'm just super, super enjoying and awesome. um, just having that like 
let's do this. And like seeing again, just like feeding off the audience. Like I, I like kind of forgot how much I love, love doing that, it. Like, that, that, my, that charisma that I have there is like, wow. Like I, I completely forgot I had this and coming back to it. It's something that just is making me so excited to honestly, that's what I love about podcasting too, because it's like some people are so much better when you just hear them speak. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's a way to deliver a message that you can't get from a 15 second reel or reading a post on Instagram or reading an email. And you can I can hear your passion in your voice when you're talking about these things. And I think that is incredible. Um, Thank you. If you could change one thing about one thing in this world, what would you change? Oh, I think we already know the answer to this question. (laughs) I would get rid of diet culture. I think that's like my biggest thing is like, I want to change diet culture. I don't want it to be there anymore. I want people to like feel free and like have things that they enjoy and like not feel guilt about it. I think that that's something that it can affect so many facets of our life, whether it's access to food, whether it's the food availability and affordability, all these things, along with how you feel about your body. There's so many things that I think we covered here under the the guise of diet culture. culture. And I often talk about bounce back culture, which is essentially Mm -hmm. diet culture, you know, in terms of postpartum. And it it truly, it's all encompassing. We talk about, you know, supremacy culture. We talk about misogyny. We talk about self-worth and control from, you know, media, right? There's so many aspects of it. And I want people to feel free in their bodies and in free yeah. in their relationship with food. Definitely. Um, that is so, so huge. And Annika, what would you feel, what do you feel is your biggest strength? I think my ability to connect with people is one of my biggest strengths. Um, I'm like, let's toot my own horn. I'm very relatable when I talk to my patients. I feel like I treat it more like, let's just have a conversation. And I think that's my biggest strength is just like removing a lot of that, like kind of white coat aspect hierarchy yeah yeah let's let's come back to like we're on the same level here like let's talk about this because it makes it so much more free because again food's really personal it's that relationship like it's a relationship that you have with yourself it's a relationship that you have with other people like it's a relationship that you have with your body the food around you again like all these things they all play a role and coming into that space of let's just like come like let's just meet at the same point whether yeah. I'm, I'm over here and you're over there, let's just like meet at the same point at this time. And then we'll talk about it. Go, go through it together. Yeah. Yeah. Then like, I always tell my patients, like, I'm here to guide you. I'm not here to tell you. Yeah. Um, so like, I'm going to give you tools so then you can succeed. It's not, it has nothing to do with me. I'm just, I'm just a messenger. Mm-hmm. Like, don't like treat me like I, like your guilt of me. There's no like judgment in my treatment of you. I just want you to know that like, I'm just here to guide you. Like you dealing with your IBS, let me guide you on how you can deal with it. So then eventually you don't have to see me anymore. Yeah. Like I'm like thinking, okay, I have so many clients now that need to talk to you. (laughs) I'm going to send my brother to you because seriously, these things matter. And one thing that I think it's important to note is a lot of cultural foods, not just Indian, but like different Caribbean foods, Mm -hmm. they're very healthified in terms of like, yes you know, you're basically changing, oh, can't eat rice, have cauliflower rice. Oh, can't eat this, have that. And you're like, you're literally changing the entire meal. And I think it's important to note that you don't make people do that is you're honoring people's lifestyles and cultures and foods as is, and just adding Mm -hmm. to it rather than trying to completely make it a different thing. Yeah. I think like the rice thing is the biggest one because so many cultures, aside from Western cultures, eat rice. Yeah. And I think that like it's like a perfect vehicle for so many things. Like, oh, throw something like throw those like green lentils in there. Okay, throw some chickpeas in there. Okay, throw some frozen vegetables in there. And they're like, Oh, I can eat rice then. I'm like, you can have as much rice as you want. <laughs> it just depends on what you're doing with it. Yeah. And like you can put all the spices you want in there. Oh, I can put oil in there. And I'm like, yeah, how are you going to cook that rice? You need, you need something. Yeah. <laughs> you need something to cook it. So like, you know, that's something that like, I, again, like I work with someone and their cultural needs, uh, whether they're 
Indian, like Arab, Pakistani, like which is basically the same as Indian because we're all just British. Similar. India. Yeah. It's I just like I'm like okay the Brits like separated the us, Brits so. separated <laughs> us randomly by religion <laughs> and whatever and you're like man we're the same like we're, we're the same we were part of the yeah. same place yeah yeah well like north indians and fox body people like we all have the same food so it's like yeah. we're the same people it's very similar um, yeah it's just divided by a line anyway so like you know and then i have lots of like clients from egypt and different parts of africa and the caribbean you know i have a lot of exposure to food because i was able to travel a lot um which is very very lucky and very privileged of me but i was able to do that and experience food and I'm a foodie so I like to like explore and I still need like, to try that restaurant that you shared um I think it's called marked right yeah oh so good so good I just saw my list I'm like I watch your food and I'm like whatever vegan vegetarian stuff you share I'm like yep I'm gonna gonna check that out yeah. well Annika mm-hmm. thank you so much for spending your time with me today and for sharing all of your expertise your experience you totally are relatable and I loved Thanks. hearing you talk. You're such a natural. And for anyone who found this conversation beneficial, share it with a friend that needs to hear it. 